Hi, my name is Gary Green, and I will be sharing with you today some information about how a part of the DuPage Symphony Orchestra works. Please note that I will be simplifying this discussion to avoid overloading you with exceptions and special cases. A symphony orchestra, like the DSO, is made up of four families of instruments. There are the strings, the woodwinds, the brass, and the percussion. I am the principal horn, so I sit in the brass section. The sounds produced by all of these instruments are based on vibrations created in the materials from which the instruments are made. In general, the bigger the mass of material, the lower the pitch that will sound, and the smaller the mass, the higher the pitch. In the string family, the five primary vibra vibrators are the strings, which of course are actually wires, that the players set in motion by bowing or plucking. The players move their fingers up and down the fingerboards, pressing firmly on the strings so as to make the sound, sounding length of the strings longer or shorter. In the woodwind family, the primary vibrators are the columns of air in the tubes that make up those instruments. The tubes have holes in them, and generally, as the players cover more holes, the sounding length of the tube gets longer and the pitch goes down, or they uncover the holes and the pitch goes up. The percussion family consists of both pitched instruments and unpitched instruments. Snare drums and bass drums would be examples of unpitched instruments, and when the player strikes one of these with a stick or a beater, a satisfying whack is heard that is sort of high for the snare drum and sort of low for the bass drum, but you don't hear an actual pitch. On the other hand, if the player strikes one of the chimes, a specific pitch is generated. Just looking at a set of chimes immediately confirms the point that different sizes of metal are present and longer chimes produce lower pitches than shorter chimes. The correlation of bigger, lower certainly applies in the brass section. Big tubas sound lower pitches than small trumpets. And the woodwind idea of a vibrating tube of air is also involved here. But brass players do not produce different pitches by changing the length of the air tube as woodwind players do. Instead, brass players take advantage of a characteristic of pitch known as the harmonic series. And here we're going to get a bit technical. A pitch that you hear is actually composed of the main pitch, which is known as the fundamental, and a whole lot of other and considerably softer pitches. Think for a moment about the sound wave that is the main pitch. Let's say that wave, sound wave is eight feet long. At the same time you're hearing the pitch from eight feet of wave, you're also hearing the pitch from half of that length, and the pitch of one third of that length, and a fourth of that length, etc. Each of these additional pitches are overtones of the fundamental, and the fundamental plus its overtones are called harmonics. Here's what, in front of the music stand, here's what the harmonic series looks like in musical notation. You're, you may have a little difficulty seeing this, but we'll have this as an attachment to this um, video, and you can see it better there. But if you could see clearly, you would see that there's a very low pitch at the far left side of the top line of notation. And it has a number one on top of it because it's the first of the series. Then an the next note is an octave higher, the next note is a fifth higher, and then another octave and so forth, and they all have numbers. And on this series, they go from number one, the fundamental, through harmonic number 32. Now, the, the, the sound actually goes beyond 32, but, it <clears throat> but they just keep getting softer and softer and softer. And eventually, uh, of course, you don't hear them at all. So in review, when that low C that's marked with number one is sounded, you also hear the other 31 pitches that are shown. These other pitches get progressively weaker, that is softer, as you climb the series. And one should know also that they get less pure as well. For example, notice that there are two Fs that are harmonics 21 and 22. Number 21 is on the low side of a true F. And number 22 is on the high side, although not high enough to be an F sharp, which we see as number 23. 
So it's a pretty impure F. So let's go back to vibration. Brass players set their column of air into vibration by buzzing their lips into a mouthpiece. Many brass players are able to buzz with just their lips, but I'm not one of them. So you'll have to ask around in the DSO brass section if you want to experience that. The mouthpiece gives some support to the lip muscles and the player uses just enough pressure on the mouthpiece to ensure a seal. It is important that lip vibration happen inside the mouthpiece and no lip vibration happen outside. The mouthpiece is short. As you can see, mine is about two inches or so in length. Uh, tuba mouthpieces, of course, are much larger and trombone and trumpet mouthpieces are in between. Um, but it's so short that it easily produces those pitches that are clustered around towards the upper part of the harmonic series. And so you can actually play melodies just on the mouthpiece. But add to that mouthpiece to create a longer tube, and suddenly one is better able to deal with the lower harmonic. At the same time, however, one is also limited to just the harmonics for the fundamental pitch of this new tube. What's happening now is that the player is forcing an emphasis on one of those harmonics to make it sound more audibly. That's a great thing. Look at and listen to all the notes that are theoretically available to pull out of the harmonic series through this emphasis. Here I am on the open horn, no fingers involved. But there's a downside as well. As a brass player, you cannot play a pitch between, say, harmonics four and five. You can tighten and relax the lips and muscles as much as you want, but you cannot insert yourself into the space between the harmonics. So we have Now I'll try to play those notes in between. Do you hear how it kind of locks into one of those harmonics? Um, and, uh, but it doesn't play all the notes. There's this sort of glissando between the pitches that actually pop out. Now, the, this phenomenon uh, is true for any tube of air, not just the expensive ones in the DSO. For example, here I am with a length of garden hose to, using the top of a two liter pop bottle for a bell. Now, my garden hose has two kinks in it, there and somewhere. I can't see the other one right now. But, oh, here it is. And uh, so those disrupt the flow of the sound wave through the, through the garden hose a little bit. And of course, the garden hose is uneven. In, uh, the interior diameter of the garden hose is not, this, not perfect all the way through the way you would expect a multi-thousand dollar brass instrument to be. Nevertheless, if I stick my mouthpiece into the, into the uh, business end of the garden hose, I can get harmonics. And they're kind of funny because, again, the, the instrument is, is not clean in terms of its diameter all the way through. It's also a different kind of instrument than, than what I play in that the, the, side, the tubing is more or less the same, that is to say it's cylindrical, whereas on a horn and on tubas, the instrument is largely conical, that is it gradually gets bigger. Trumpets and trombones are more like this in that they tend to be pretty much the same uh, diameter all the way through. So what does this mean in the orchestra? Well, first it means that music written before the invention of valves 
can only include brass instruments on those pitches that are available to the players through the harmonic series. Bach, Handel, Haydn, and Mozart, for example, all understood this limitation, and they would specify the length of instrument they wanted. So you see music for trumpet in C or trumpet in B flat, and the players wound up taking a collection of instruments in different keys, that is having different fundamentals, to the concert hall. Horn players in the 18th century came up with a partial workaround to get them some additional pitches, but that's a topic for another day. At the beginning of the 19th century, instrument makers began experimenting with ways to have a trumpet in C and a trumpet in B flat in a single instrument. You'd start with a basic tube length, and then you'd make available a few inches of more tubing, enough to lower the pitch of the tube to a new fundamental. And this made available to the player an additional harmonic series. A valve was introduced to facilitate shifting between the tube lengths and thus between the harmonic series. At first, players and composers continued to think in terms of a player performing an entire piece on one series. That is, a valved horn, for example, was thought of as a collection of horns in one entity. So the first movement of a symphony might call for horn in E flat, which would have this series. And the second movement might call for horn in C, which would have this series. move the valves around, they would sit on one valve uh, collection, uh, first valve in the case of horn and E flat, first and third valve in the case of C, horn and C, through the entire piece, and those were all the notes they had to play. And for this reason, you could look at a trumpet, for example, and say that there are actually seven trumpets there. The trumpet not using any valves, the trumpet using the first valve, the trumpet using the second valve, the trumpet using the first and, or second and third valves together, the trumpet using the first and second valves together, and so forth. My horn is what is known as a double horn. There are several, seven horns starting with F and going down through the valve combination, which are this top layer of slides. And then there's another horn that starts in B flat and works its way down through the seven horns that are here. And that's the bottom layer of, of uh, slides that are here. So I have 14, and uh, it's very common for uh, horn players to have a double horn. There are triple, triple horns as well, but that's sort of a specialty uh, instrument. <clears throat> Our friends in the trombone section had this same valve setup, except they don't have a valve. Rather, they have a slide, and when they move the slide about three inches, it gets them to a new harmonic series. Guess how many slide positions there are. If you guessed seven, you were right. A slide position corresponding to each of the possible valve combinations on the valved brass instruments. But that 18th century thinking, uh, uh, one set of, uh, of notes per horn, so to speak, soon gave way to the 19th century view of brass instruments as being what we call chromatic. That is capable of all the notes, just like a flute or a violin. <clears throat> and while players are not generally conscious of doing so when they play a scale, for example, brass players are actually jumping across these various tubes to get the pitches that they need. A C scale for me, for example, is open, first, open, first, open, first and second, second, and open. So to play that scale, I draw notes from, found on, in four different harmonic series, or four different horns on my horn. Let's see if we can uh, get this so that you can see the valve movements as I play that scale. So watch my fingers. <laughs> One of the 
challenges of brass playing is found in this hopping around from one tubing length to another. It takes a long time to develop the muscle memory in the lips to know where a given pitch may be found. Brass playing is a bit like a trapeze act where you hope to be in the same spot as the swinging bar. We hope to be have our lips in the right position when we jump to a new tube, for example. Uh, from uh, going from the fourth harmonic on one tube to the eighth harmonic on another, for example. There are also issues when one goes from a short tube to a longer tube, or a longer tube to a shorter tube. Lots of danger, lots of chances of public embarrassment. Let's close with the first part of the famous horn solo from the Tchaikovsky Fifth Symphony. Again, We'll, we'll try to get uh, the camera here so that you can see my valve changes as I play. Thank you for watching this video, and thank you for your interest in music and in the DuPage Symphony Orchestra specifically. Feel free to ask questions of any of the brass players in the orchestra.